I just wanted to feel good. Mm -hmm. It had been so long mm -hmm. since I felt good. Mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with my codependency. I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, we had one question, I said, well, is he nice? I guess we wait a couple months, and then we can hit the ground running. What are the similarities between Jada Pinkett Smith and Meghan Markle? Why is it that so many people react the same way to their statements? And what do their statements tell us about their personalities? These are the research questions for this video. This channel is all about analyzing different types of interviews and conversations. If you're excited about language, you've come to the right place. If you like this kind of video, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the like button. The first area I look at is vague and self-serving word chores. What I mean by this is that in conversations, people value honesty and transparency above all else. And some people immediately detect language that sounds phony or contrived. This doesn't automatically mean that the words we hear are in fact phony or contrived. But it does mean that we can have a hard time trusting people who use such language who seem too focused on portraying themselves in a positive light. I'll start with Jada in one of the Red Table talks. Jada and Will are discussing the aftermath of Jada's entanglement, as she calls it. She's downplaying her actions. I think um, you need to say clearly what happened. As far as what? You and I decided we were going to take our space and what happened. Yeah, and then I got into an entanglement with August. That's what I said. An entanglement? Yes. <laughs> yes. A relationship? Yes, it was a relationship, absolutely. I was in a lot of pain, and I was very broken. She says, that's what I said, appealing to how she's allegedly being honest, and letting Will know that he should be able to remember, and more importantly, believe what she said. It's important to note that Jada is serious when she uses the word entanglement. It's only when Will starts laughing that she joins him. Will laughs because entanglement is an extreme euphemism. So initially, she thinks she can get away with using this distancing noun. When she finds out she can't, she parrots Will's word relationship, as if entanglement and relationship are one and the same, and as if she's now perfectly fine admitting this. However, by starting with entanglement, she unwillingly showed that she found a more truthful word like relationship problematic, problematic for her agenda. It's, it's healing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Yeah. Even though this is minuscule, I do feel like it's these kinds of things that create the world that we're in. Mm -hmm. And the idea of not communicating, yeah. not talking about it, not clearing the air, mm -hmm. and just being as transparent. Mm -hmm. Just Absolutely. being transparent. The sentence. It's, it's healing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Is unspecific. She doesn't define what she means and needs to happen is devoid of agency, meaning there's no mention of who should initiate the healing. Jada speaks in general terms that don't hold her accountable. She does the same when she says, And I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Yeah. Even though this is minuscule, I do feel like it's these kinds of things that create the world that we're in. Mm -hmm. And the idea of not communicating, yeah. not talking about it, not clearing the air. There's no mention of who neglected the communicating, or who should have cleared the air. There's no agency. Instead, she makes it sound like a general problem, and also a collaborative effort that Will is part of. Because she places the relationship in this larger context of world problems, she makes herself sound all the more generous for even articulating this minuscule problem. And she says, this is minuscule. The pronoun this makes the problem objectively minuscule. Once more, there's a notable lack of agency, and the coping mechanism that's so prevalent in Will allows her to get away with this kind of language, making a specific hurtful action she did sound general and even useful for other people to learn from. I'll get back to Will's and Prince Harry's roles in a moment. Next, Jada makes a pseudo-psychoanalysis of herself. Suddenly, she's willing to point out the flaws she has. In a context like this, people largely criticize themselves for self-interest. Hiding behind psychological terms is a way for Jada to evade responsibility. I think that has a lot to do with my codependency. 
which is another thing that I had to learn to break in this cycle, mm -hmm. just that idea of needing to fix and being drawn to people that need help, whether it's your health or whether it's your addictions. Mm -hmm. There's something about that childhood trauma mm -hmm. um, that feels as though it can be fixed through fixing people mm -hmm. versus fixing me. Yeah. With words like learn and needed to fix, she turns this conversation into a therapy session and makes it about her personal development. She says being drawn to people that need help. This is passive voice, removing agency from her. Instead, she's simply being drawn. Let's turn the attention to Megan and Harry's engagement interview. Megan denies knowing much about Harry and it's sensitive to her to keep repeating this. I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question, I said, well, is he nice? So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits, I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before, mm -hmm. and... I think for both of us, though, it was, it was really refreshing because, given that I didn't know a lot about him, everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him. Anything I learned about him and his family was what he would share with me, and vice versa, so for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. Much implies that she did know something about him. However, by denying her knowledge, she places emphasis on her own qualities as a human being, merely searching for someone nice. With this, she proposes that she wasn't attracted to his status, but to his kindness. However, we observe stilted language in form of the adjectives authentic and organic which, ironically, makes the way they met sound less authentic and organic, not just because it's sensitive for her to highlight this, but because the words themselves seem out of place in describing supposed attraction. As a side note, untimely and strange formulations were also a major part of the Irish Times' harsh criticism of Megan's book The Bench. The book was criticized for a total lack of story, and for being a long list of disparate statements that don't rhyme. The reviewer gives this as an example. He'll feel happiness, sorrow, one day be heartbroken. You'll tell him, I love you. Those words always spoken. Before calling the book awful, the reviewer writes, Who speaks like that? Nobody does. In the following, rather than giving specific answers, Megan resorts to vague talk about voice and repetitions of contrived figures of speech. The concept voice, whatever it means, is her go-to response. She starts with saying that she hasn't been in the UK for very long, which is an excuse for the evasive answer she's about to give. Megan, you touched on it before. Mm -hmm. You have, it's well known, you've championed the empowerment of women and young girls and promoting their self-worth. How do you hope to continue that work with the Royal Foundation? Um, yes, I mean, I think that knowing that I've, I've just been here for three months, right? <laughs> and in that you've amount of time. For, well, but with that said, for me, it's very important to, once you hit the ground running, even if you're doing it quietly behind the scenes, which is what I've focused my energy on thus far, is meeting with the right people, meeting with the right organizations behind the scenes quietly, learning as much as I can so that I can maximize the opportunity we have here to really make an impact. I think you'll often hear people say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. There is no better time than to really continue to shine a light on women feeling empowered. Um, yeah, just, um, I guess we wait a couple months and then we can hit the ground running. Like Jada, Megan's focused on making personal experiences and decisions sound like they have general applications. In the Oprah interview, she repeats the voice concept as she makes herself the victim and hero when describing how she lost her voice and got it back. Megan dreams up causality, referring to the little mermaid falling in love with the prince. She says, because of that, she has to lose her voice. This wishful thinking makes it sound like the decision to leave the UK was out of Megan's control and part of a bigger plan. Linguistically, this relieves Megan of responsibility. She then makes it sound like her voice applies to everyone else. She says she shares this because there's so many people who are afraid to voice that they need help. She uses the voice concept as a stepping stone to advertise for their mental health series. 
Like Jada, Megan makes a personal issue sound greater than it is and sound like a teachable moment for everyone else. Sounding like spokespeople comes naturally to both Jada and Megan. However, there's a lack of specificity and real authenticity that makes it difficult for many people to relate to the words they use. In general, we identify ourselves with people who aren't focused on being perceived as authentic, but who are simply speaking and experiencing in the moment. The second area I'll cover in this video is how Jada and Megan interact with Will and Harry, respectively. There are differences here as Jada is more direct and the issues they discuss are different. But the way they take control of the conversations is similar. It's sensitive to them to have this control in order to control the narrative. Let's return to the Red Table talk. Jada makes sure to remind Will that August fulfilled a role that he could no longer fulfill, allegedly. Launched into an interaction mm -hmm. with August. What do you feel like um, you were looking for? I just wanted to feel good. Mm -hmm. It had been so long mm -hmm. since I felt good. Yeah. She uses drawn out speech and dramatic vowel stress to emphasize the importance of her needs and feelings. Next, we notice how defensive Jada gets the minute Will acts like he's finally going to hold her accountable. So we come to the red table. So I'm in the, I'm in the Jada position right now. So, okay. you know, you during that time launched into an interaction mm -hmm. with August. What do you feel like um, you were looking for? Initially, Will has a playful demeanor, but Jada doesn't mirror his demeanor with her serious facial expression while saying, So, okay. you know, you... She achieves two things. She lets Will know that she doesn't find it funny, and she gives Will a hint to tone down what he's about to say. This linguistic element and her facial expression show that she's somewhat nervous for what's about to follow. Will then adjusts his facial expression to mirror Jada's. During that time launched into... Next, Will does what he does best, avoid confrontation to instead make fun of the feelings that he implicitly admits to having. And now Jada laughs with him, even though what Will says is actually serious, despite his joking tone. I feel like that husband, like I'm with you at the press conference. <laughs> and that husband, I'm with, now I gotta be with you at the press conference <laughs> while you like to tell the world uh, about your transgressions. <laughs> Like, I love, I love my baby. I'm going to stand by my baby no matter what. Jada then goes on to evade responsibility by denying Will's word transgression. Instead, she makes the situation about her personal development. Well, you know, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely understand mm -hmm. um, why it would look that way or feel that way. But I actually don't look at it as a transgression at all. Through that particular journey, I learned so much. Mm -hmm about myself and was able to really confront a lot of emotional immaturity, mm -hmm. emotional insecurity. Controlling the conversational direction like this is easy for Jada. We ride together, we, we die, die together. together. Bad, Bad marriage, marriage for, for life. life. <laughs> 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 That's terrible. In the engagement interview, there were clear moments when Megan deemed it necessary to control the conversation. How did you first meet? Uh, mm. Yes, we first met, we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect her privacy protect and not her privacy, reveal yeah. too much of that. And um, Megan interjects as she focuses her gaze on Harry. Uh, mm. yes, we this interjection is a presupposition that Megan knows there is a story to tell and that the story is potentially dangerous. It's also a hint to Harry that she also has something to say about their first meeting. Harry says, Who, um, we will... The hesitation marker indicates that he's looking for a way to finish the sentence. The subject that the interviewer brought up is obviously sensitive to Megan, since she doesn't wait for Harry to finish. She says, We should protect her privacy. And while looking at the interviewer, but she then focuses her gaze on Harry as she says, Not Don't tell privacy, yeah. too much of that. And um, this last part becomes a reminder to Harry, a reminder that he should be careful in answering this question. Megan's initial interjection and now this reminder indicate that she wants to control the answer to this question. Yes, it was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind date. It was a blind date, and for sure. 
because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so she says, because she's from the States and she uses the generalizing pronoun you, not I. This is association, making it sound like you're not alone in having a certain opinion. Have you you've met each other's families, I imagine? Yes, his family's been so welcoming and, and we've just had a really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of, of not just the mm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. They were asked about meeting each other's families, but Meghan immediately takes the word to talk about Harry's family. And with the personal pronoun, we, she speaks for the both of them. Also, looking at the Oprah interview, it's clear that Meghan's way of interacting with Harry has cost him a lot. She went to him and said that she feared for her mental health, and Harry says that he went to a very dark place as well. The last two words, as well, suggest that he wasn't in a dark place prior to Meghan saying this to him. He reiterates his shock with, I was terrified. He goes on to say that because he could see where things were headed, he took matters into his own hands, which implies leaving the UK. I consider these statements even more important in light of Oprah's confrontational questions. Oprah confronts Meghan with people's negative opinions about her, that she manipulated, calculated, and is responsible for the decision to leave. Initially, Meghan doesn't deny these opinions. She makes an interjection and says it's amazing how they can use Meg for everything. Oprah then introduces the idea that Meghan went into the royal life with an intention to build her brand. Notice what Meghan doesn't say. She doesn't say, no, it's not true, or something similar. She remains unassertive as she asks the counter question, can you imagine how little sense that makes? Answering with a question in this type of context is a red flag in statement analysis. Immediately after this, Meghan turns the attention to how she was allegedly overlooked by Harry's family. With Oprah's confrontational questions or statements in mind, this is linguistic self-defense on Meghan's part. It's obviously sensitive to her to present herself as overlooked or as a victim. She says there was no guidance or training, nothing that was offered to her. Unlike what you see in movies, as she says, which suggests unrealistic expectations on her part. In this victim narrative, she makes a challenge sound like a big problem when she says that no one thought to say, you're American, you're not going to know the national anthem. She says she sat late at night and Googled the national anthem. Also, this is a claim. There's no way of verifying it. She says she just wanted to make them proud, which makes her sound humble and self-effacing, and thus portrays her in a positive light. And the most important point, Megan successfully moves the goalpost. This line of questioning started with Oprah asking her about people's suspicions, and Megan goes on to criticize Harry's family and all the staff at the royal family. Oprah's confrontational style intimidated Megan because it damaged her victim narrative, so much so that she had to engage in linguistic self-defense. In conclusion, we see similarities in how Jada and Megan control the conversation to portray themselves in the best light possible. Also, they put their needs and feelings first. Their linguistic choices reveal as much. Will and Harry are both hesitant, and they both avoid conflict. You got a, a whole restart. Mm -hmm. You have a whole new focus, a whole new nucleus. How does that land with you? No, I think the focus is very much the same. Right? Is it? Yeah, oh. certainly from, from, from my, yeah. Own, my wife's point of view. Yeah. If you liked the video, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the like button. See you in the next video.